Good afternoon, everybody. Um, welcome to the, the second session. Um, this session is on promising business models. Uh, I'm Brian Hull from Ubiquity Press, and we have um, three very interesting um, sets of speakers um, to, to guide us in this topic. Um, I'm going to let each of them introduce each other. I'm going to play a very minimal role here because I think we've got relatively long presentations and we want to have as much time as possible for discussion. Um, obviously, um, business models are something which are very, very important as we move into the open access ebook world. Uh, people want to know not only that their content is going to be open access, but they want to know that it's going to be better disseminated. They want to know that it's going to be an affordable model, that uh, prices are going to come down, because I'm also an archaeologist, and I know very well from my own field that the book prices are very, very high. And more often than not, people even they even cite the reviews of books rather than the books themselves because they can't afford to get access to the actual book. So hopefully, with with new models of dissemination, we'll also be able to see um, prices coming down, and that might be an, an interesting part of these presentations. So I'm going to let each of the, the speakers introduce themselves um, for about one minute each, and then we're going to go into 15-minute presentations. Um, at the end of each of those, we'll, we'll allow one burning question, if it's specific to the, the talk that was given. Um, and then we'll have time for more questions at the end. So we'll um, start off with Francis. I'm Francis Pinto. Is this working? Can you hear me? Is it working? Um, I'm Francis Pinto, a long time academic publisher with my own company, um, setting up Central European University Press, also more recently Bloomsbury Academic. Uh, in between, I worked for the Soros Foundation, where I worked with libraries and set up IFL, the Electronic Information for Libraries Library Consortium. And I've been obsessing over the problems of academic monographs for many decades. So I'm going to be talking to you about Knowledge Unlatched, my latest initiative. I'm Carrie Calder. I'm Director of Market Development at Palgrave Macmillan. Um, at Palgrave, I'm responsible for our marketing and communications strategy, but also our open access initiatives, which is what I'm going to be talking through today. Prior to um, joining Palgrave, I was at Biomed Central for almost nine years, so really started um, in the open access STM environment with journals and now applying that to monographs. My name is Martin Eve. Um, I'm a lecturer in English Literature at the University of Lincoln, um, and I'm also a certified computer programmer. Uh, certified, perhaps being the good word in that sentence. Um, along with Caroline, I'm co-founding the Open Library of Humanities project that we're going to talk about today. And I'm Dr. Caroline Edwards, um, yep, co-founder of the Open Library of Humanities. I'm a lecturer at the University of Lincoln. I specialise in 21st century literature, and I'm shortly moving just down the road to the uh, Birkbeck University of London. Okay, thank you very much. And so we'll actually go straight on into the presentations now. So we'll start with, um, with Caroline and Martin talking about the Digital Library of the Humanities. Or Open Library. Okay, great. So I'm just going to talk you through um, a little bit of uh, the background specifically to our project, the Open Library of Humanities, and how this relates to monograph publishing in the humanities. Um, I mean, in terms of some of the presentations uh, that we've already heard, particularly from Rupert Gatti and Jean-Claude um, Guédon, our approach to rethinking scholarship at the Open Library of Humanities is what you might call on the kind of left wing of open access publishing. We're considering this in terms of building a prestigious, reputable uh, platform for monograph, journal, and um, mega journal publishing. Um, and our, we're going to have a kind of phased introduction in order to gently coax all of our colleagues with us into this digital future. Our priority then is to evaluate current forms of publishing and what forms of labor are involved, uh, which I guess is why we're on the business models panel. We're not here to deny the realities of publisher labor, uh, particularly with so many publishers in the room, of course. We don't want to alienate anybody, uh, but we would like to think through quite carefully how we might make those costs more transparent. Okay, so just to start off with then... Um, uh, it's probably worth reminding ourselves of the primary definition of open access, the removal of price and permission barriers from research achieved through online dissemination. Um, 
I suppose we're thinking here about an old tradition and a new technology, as Peter Suber has described it, which have converged to make possible this unprecedented public good. And I want to draw out that old tradition in particular. As an academic myself and with Martin, we're very aware of the way in which humanities scholars conceive of their work um, in a public-spirited gesture of disseminating research, but also there are certain sort of um, traditional criteria, if you like, to building prestige, which are very relevant to building academic careers and hiring and tenure committees in particular. Okay, so just to draw you on then to this serials crisis, which has been well documented. Um, the graph that you can see up here then shows with the red line, uh, serials expenditure as uh, categorized by the American Association of Research Libraries, it's up 380%. And the green line is the UK Commodities Price Index or CPI, which closely mirrors US inflation up 80%. So broadly speaking, as I'm sure many of you are extremely aware, over the past 40 years, subscription prices have substantially risen faster than inflation and library budgets, uh, up to 300% above inflation since 1986. And this really affects all of us. It's not just, um, you know, the top-end institutions are affected, as are institutions around the world. There's a very unequal share of research funding, perhaps in different areas of the developing world and their research budgets. Um, I suppose there's also worth mentioning, as Kathleen Fitzpatrick has written, um, the, the dot-com bubble sort of exacerbated this problem, particularly over in America, and endowments were severely affected. So I guess we can all agree that there is a crisis going on, and we want to think how the crisis in um, journal publishing relates to monographs, which is why we're here today. Okay, so just to say something about what we're calling this exclusionary um, APC model, if you like, article processing charges. Uh, I just want to emphasize that the Open Library of Humanities is proposing that a gold route to open access does not have to be synonymous with article processing charges. We are looking for an APC free solution so that authors are not prevented from where they might be able to publish. Um, I guess it's worth sort of reminding ourselves that open access isn't the same thing as free access. Um, as John Walensky describes, then we're not, we're not trying to deny these economic realities, but we are interested in increasing access, you know, for more people. Uh, right. I was just going to talk you through then um, a couple of the options, perhaps, since we're here talking about business models. What could the possibilities be for open access monographs? Well, the first option then... Um, would be to have uh, free labour and free submission. This is happening in the journal sector, as we see small niche academic journals relying on the open journal systems, the OJS. Uh, this vastly reduces publication costs, but as far as we're concerned on our project, it, we need to think about upscaling that. We need to find ways to connect with other open access publishers um, and think about a kind of more large scale project. Another option might be advertising revenue, um, where you would have free submission for authors but um, this seems extremely unfavourable to us. We wouldn't want to be publishing an article on eco-criticism only to find that, you know, an advert for Shell Oil was on the opposite page. Um, the article processing charge then, the author pays mechanism, which, as we've heard already, uh, there are various different kind of banded prices being uh, released by publishers. Um, so that's, uh, you know, kind of one format uh, that we could face. And then finally, the one that, we've, that we kind of favour, the um, library partnership subsidy model, if I have a, no, sorry, if I have a slide about that. Um, library partnership subsidies then, as far as we're concerned, um, would involve a large number of libraries contributing a small rate so that everybody can access material for free. We have been advised that we should ban this rate depending on the size of the research library budget, but it would average out perhaps at around 600 um, US dollars. I'm going to speak to that a little bit more, but first I wanted to come back to what I talked about, an old tradition of scholarship. This is extremely important for monograph publishing, and we're calling this the prestige trap. Um, academics uh, confer authority on the particular publishers that they choose to publish with and the particular journals that they choose to publish with. So in that sense, there's a kind of legacy of print culture that um, there's a certain sort of gatekeeper model which is rooted in print e economics in which um, because of the cost, the, you know, the, the expensive costs of paper production, mailing, um, you know, sort of sending out uh, journals and things to your subscribers. 
Okay, so this logic of exclusion then doesn't seem to be applicable anymore in a digital realm, and I'd really like to kind of highlight that. We shouldn't just be transferring traditional models into the digital realm. I very much agree um, with the perspective that actually this is a transformative moment that we could use to try and change the way that we do scholarship and the way that we share it. And that brings me to the question of implicit standards of peer review. Um, so we're thinking about this on our committees, which are currently having discussions um, on the Open Library of Humanities and on the website you can see published anonymised transcripts of those discussions. We would like to see um, some sort of new thinking developing along ideas of peer review. Uh, as Jean-Claude Guédon and Raymond Siemens have noted then, we should be thinking about dis um, distinguishing the distinction phase from the publishing phase. Um, as they've cited in the credibility of electronic publishing. So what is it that creates the prestige of a monograph um, and, and how could we rethink that? Uh, questions about blind peer review um, and open review or post-publication peer review are models that we're also looking at as well. But I'll move on um, swiftly to um, our monograph pilot. So I mentioned that we run an op a mega journal as well as a um, open access monograph scheme uh, at the Open Library of Humanities. And I'll just talk you through that a little bit. Because of the importance of prestige amongst the academic community, we have um, found ourselves some high-profile partners. We felt that was very important in the launch phase of the OLH to distinguish what we're doing. And so that academics, particularly younger academics, I know there was a question earlier about younger academics, will trust that this is a safe space in which they can publish. Um, although we agree with Jean-Claude that a book needn't be thought of as a bound codex, um, authors do value the editorial input of book editors, which is why we wanted to partner and gain you know, the editorial expertise of high-profile university presses, of which we have three currently um, in very close discussions with us who are interested in joining our pilot scheme, uh, as well as one born open access publisher. So that will help us to get a sense of um, what the costs are involved in bringing a monograph, you know, from conception, from the moment when an author submits it to the publisher, right through to um, production. Our rationale then is to try and break the prestige trap I've just discussed and to give legitimacy to our project. Um, and we know that authors, academics and scholarly authors value editorial experience, so that's why we're working with those partners. Moving on then, the financial model. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, at the moment, a lot of libraries pay money so that everyone can kind of rent material. Um, scholarly material becomes a property. Even in uh, library consortia, which you know, brings down perhaps the numbers of uh, journals and monographs that are being sold, this is still the case. So we would like to see a lot of libraries paying a small amount. In this sense, there are two routes as we see it, and I'll be very interested to hear Francis talk a little bit later. The first would be to build a library consortium as Knowledge Unlatched is in the process of doing, as I understand it. And the second then would be perhaps to coordinate directly with libraries, the library partnership subsidy model that we're looking at. And, and at the OLH, we're in the sort of discussions phase of um, both of those projects. Um, just to talk you through then the monograph, we see the mega journal um, in the style perhaps of PLOS, but in the humanities on a slightly smaller scale, I guess, cross-subsidising our monograph pilot study. We think the two things are integrally bound. Um, in terms of our pilot then, each publisher that we're working with would receive um, around £25,000 per year in order to part participate in the study uh, and they would agree to release their costs to us which we could then publish in an open uh, format so that everybody could see how much it is actually costing us. They would be publishing a minimum of three books per year during the pilot and we have agreed that they would be co-branded, the Open Library of Humanities and the publisher. Um, and I'll hand over to Martin for the rest of the talk. Okay, thank you, Caroline. So I want to think through what the deliverables might be for this kind of costing study stroke pilot period of a monograph um, initiative. Um, we need very traditional formats in some senses, um, although we want to go beyond what the book is. The bound codex cannot be the standard for too much longer in a world of digital dissemination. This always has to be a phased transitionary model. So we're looking at the damned PDF, as it's known in some circles. Um, <laughs> However, the way of getting beyond uh, the damned PDF is to make sure that we have open intermediary formats that we can translate into new mechanisms. So for that reason, we've agreed that XML formats have to be key to this process, and our partners have agreed that they will give us the source XML. And that's vital for a reason of digital preservation that I'm going to come back to as well. Um, we need to be working all the time in open formats when we're online because we can't foresee where our futures take us. Uh, try and open Apple Works document on your new Mac and you'll struggle. 
the PDF will go the same way at some point. Uh, we need to be able to forward migrate content. Um, and, of course, we should be using born digital web technologies. HTML should become a fundamental standard of how we read. Uh, we just need to find ways of emulating the reading experience of the codex so that we get that. Um, but as technology matures in the e-reading world, HTML can become a more viable proposition there. And, of course, if we have open formats, there may be formats beyond those that we haven't thought of that we can transition to, not even beyond EPUB, for example. Um, oh, by the way, I should mention also that we've agreed CC BY as a condition of that as well. I think that open licensing is an incredibly important part of this for reasons of translation and digital forward migration. So that's part of the deal. Um, I've mentioned digital preservation briefly, and I'm going to mention it again. Um, it's crucial to me that scholarship exists beyond the length of a human lifespan. Um, if I get run over by a bus tomorrow, it's crucial that my journals keep going. And how noble is that of me to say? Um, <laughs> Locks and clocks are the standard formats for that. Um, they're not particularly flexible, but nonetheless, they do a very good job of preserving that content. Um, it seems to me also that we could leverage a community effort. Um, open access activists tend to be um, involved types. Why not use peer-to-peer -peer protocols for digital preservation as well there? So that's something we're thinking about. So those are the, the hard deliverables, you might say. Part of this project that we're putting together on the monograph side is to actually get books out there. And by books, OK, I'm talking quite traditionally in some senses, we can move forwards into experimental territory later. The second part, though, as Caroline mentioned, is this focus on labor that I want to bring to the fore. It seems to me that what Open Access tries to do is move us into a service provider model of publishing. Publishers are telling us a range of figures for how much it costs to produce a monograph in, when they're giving us APC figures. But at present, we've got no way of seeing through that veil. Um, one publisher tells us 11,000, another says 5,900. Are we supposed to simply look at the outcomes and say, well, they produce a better book on the basis of a single book? There is no typical book, so you can't really do that. Um, furthermore, could we just say, well, obviously Manchester have a better model than Palgrave? That was a harsh thing to say. Um, I'm sure you can refute that later. Um, probably not, but I want some kind of indication of what those fees are doing. So I think it's important that the second deliverable of this project is a costing study. I'm going to very, very quickly talk you through that. So a breakdown there would include labour time, publisher labour time, which would have to include proposal review, internal manuscript review, external reader payments, proofreading, typesetting, copy editing, marketing. Now, some of those aspects can go, I'm pretty sure. Um, that internal model of review is not necessarily something that has to hold, and there are benefits to breaking that down in alternative models of peer review. But we need to think it through for the moment, because these are the costs that we're being given. Secondly, technological costs. I'm not going to go into the details there. DOI assignment, digital preservation. It all has to be paid for somewhere. Hard copy revenues. How could those offset the cost that we're being asked to pay up front? And if we're cross-subsidizing, can they still sell them? Secondly, partnership evaluation. Can this work? Can an academic-led mega-journal system cross-subsidize university press, low-revenue return book generation? Probably. But we need to see if that pans out. And last but not least, because we're running to the end of time, is there a digital symbiosis with the hard copy object? Every study I've seen where academics and the humanities are surveyed on what they like, they say the hard copy book. I've got to even admit, it's quite nice when I saw the green volume inside your handouts today with something that I wrote in it. You know, there's something tangible about it that's nice. But I'd far rather you were able to read it online. Does it detriment the sales of that hard copy object by putting it online? I guess not, and there are preliminary results coming through from various surveys, perhaps Open UK, that show it may not. We need that data to be concrete so that we can say for sure this is a good thing. Digital and the print can work together. So that's what we're planning. Um, you can ask a question now because I'm sure we've had to skirt over some of that stuff, but um, that's the basis of our monograph effort, and please come and talk to us more at any point. Thank you. Um, thanks very much, Martin and Caroline. Um, does anybody have a, a burning question that's specific to, to that particular presentation at this point? That's no, good. Nobody's burning? <laughs> okay, good. In that case, we'll ask um, Francis Pinto to come forward and speak about the um, Knowledge Unlatched project. Looking around the room, about half the people in here have heard me talk about Knowledge Unlatched. Um, <laughs> please don't go to sleep because... 
I have some new news to give you. <laughs> uh, but before then, I'm, I'm going to um, talk a little bit about open monograph models generally. Um, I borrowed this slide from OAPEN about a year ago and then adapted it uh, for our purposes. And it's a, it's a fairly good, um, it's a very good uh, collection of the way things are being done now. And just running quickly through them, uh, the first one you're familiar with, this is people have been doing this for some time, the uh, print or e-book book, uh, monograph pays for all of the origination costs and posting the book online free of charge, usually on a Creative Commons license. Um, at Bloomsbury Academic, the figures that are coming out from there, from the books that I set up that were published on open access, um, yeah, the figures are showing that not only did we sell at least as many as we would have on a closed model, but in some cases considerably more. So that's good news. Then we have the institutional support for the press. Uh, here are a couple of examples. The World Bank, the way up on high, the World Bank decreed that all of their publications should go open access, and the publisher had to scratch his head and figure out very quickly how to do it. And it's being done by getting the money from the various departments that are producing the content. A newer initiative, and is typical of some of the ones coming out of uh, particularly American uh, universities, is Amherst College. This is a very wealthy, very wealthy liberal arts college. It's decided to set up open access, free to the world. How's it paying for it? Well, the library, um, two people uh, retired. So they decided instead of hiring two more librarians, they would hire people to run the publishing. Well, that's fine until the next fashion comes along and the president of the college says, well, I'd rather have more librarians than publishing. So um, it'll be very interesting to see what happens, but these sorts of initiatives are still at the very early stage. Um, another way is uh, library press collaboration and the... the, uh, the really very excellent results coming out of M Publishing Michigan is certainly something to look at. Not every university can do this, but it's a model that is creating a lot of interest in the cross-subsidization. And then um, we have the funding body side publication fee, and there are several organizations, uh, particularly on the continent, but also the Wellcome uh, Trust here in the UK, that have funds earmarked for paying for the publication of monographs. Uh, and then we have the author side publication fees, and we've heard about how much they are. So I won't go into any detail there. And then finally, the library consortium concept, which is what Knowledge Unlatched is doing. But Peter Suber has put together a list of all sorts of different ways of funding um, open books, and Peter talks very eloquently about why books are so different to journal articles from a publishing perspective and also from an author perspective. As his argument is authors are used to making a little bit of money out of books, and they certainly go into every book project expecting to make a lot of money. So the way that one handles the life of the article, open access article, is, is very, very different from, um, from open uh, books. And there is another thing which I will refer to a couple of times. And I call it the mother-in-law syndrome. Uh, the sort of reference was made to, to, to what I'm talking about, uh, but so I talk about it slightly differently. Ever since e-books started being thought about, authors, academics that I've been publishing have said, I've got to have a beautiful book to give to my mother-in-law. <laughs> and, you know, an awful lot of money gets spent making it possible 
to get those six free copies to the author so that at least one can go to the mother-in-law. Another one to the mother, less important, but the mother-in-law. <laughs> and so this is being perpetuated. And it's, I, I don't mind, I, you know, I'm, I am a mother-in-law. Um, so I, you know, it, but it's for the academy, it's for the funders to decide whether or not this is going to continue. So knowledge unlatched and the goals. Sustainable path to open access for humanities and social sciences. We want to ensure that the HSS long form publications are as accessible as open access science journals. We want to enable other formats to be available too, but that shouldn't be paid for from the funds that are the origination funds. And we want to find ways of making library budgets go further. So our vision is libraries and publishers working together to lower the risk for both libraries and publishers. Ris lowering risk actually saves money. You can't imagine how expensive it is to keep things closed. You may want to know that in your study. Uh, and a global consortium sharing the fixed costs to create the first digital file is what we're trying to achieve. And the global support <coughs> is not just for the traditional publishers. The network, and this is very important, the network that we're creating is not just for the traditional publishers. In the first round of the pilot, which is going to be happening this autumn, we are dealing with the traditional publishers. Why? Because we had to get the street credibility from the libraries, and we did that by engaging with the credible, long, uh, traditional publishers, much the same way as to why you're engaging with three prestigious uh, companies. So you can't take, no matter how radical you want to be, you can't take your foot out of the old camp to get to the new camp. That's the point I want to make with that. So we are, we will be open to, for business to work with the new publishing operations, and I've had discussions with some of you already about that. So we're organizing the payment of fixed costs in exchange for open access uh, in a digital version. Meanwhile, publishers will remain to free to sell the print copies, other digital versions. Uh, they may charge the author for the mother-in-law copy. I don't know. Uh, so. People say, well, what are the fixed costs? I hope I'll be part of your study. Uh, because as a publisher, I know what those fixed costs are. And I know, I think I know, why there are the differences between the Paul Graves Springer model and the Manchester one. You, it's, it's very evident on the website. The Paul Graves Springer ones are CC BY. Anybody can make money out of that content. The Manchester one is CC by NC. Manchester anticipates making some money out of the print and the ebook through other channels. And therefore, it can reduce the cost that it's charging for open access. That may be just one reason. There are lots of reasons why these costs are different. A, a Midwest company. Uh, Midwest University Press has lower costs than a company located in central London. So, you know, we can't generalize. We do need a study. The key is to try and make this transparent uh, without running into antitrust difficulties. So this is a summary of what Knowledge Unlatched is doing. And it's really very, very simple. Uh, we're working with publishers to collect titles, the publisher sets what are called the title fee, which is these fixed costs, including overheads associated with that. Knowledge Unlatched collates the titles, and libraries select the titles and pay a con the, the, make a pledge and then pay for the title fee. We manage the process. And the li publishers, when they get to uh, first digital file, make it open access. Uh, we're working on preservations, and, and we're facilitating member discount. And this, for librarians in the room, is very important. We don't expect double dipping if you want a, what I call a premium <coughs> version, but you know, there's a lot of different uh, ways of referring to this. It's the, uh, either the print or the, collect, the book in the collection that 
you prefer to have. And there's a, there's a lot of scope there for um, libraries to choose, only to unlatch and pay for the open access, or if they want more, they get the pr premium version. And this is what libraries want. Academics want a lot of, that's not meant for you to read. That's just <laughs> meant to show that there's a lot of scope for added value. And libraries want things, authors want things. Everybody wants the publishers to do more, uh, but it's distinguishing that added value and figuring out what it is that people really want to pay for. So here's an example of what happens. Uh, I've, I've used this in dollars, $10,000, $15,000. Um, you're going to ask me what, what, what's the price of books coming in at Knowledge Unlatched uh, to be unlatched, and it's between six, dollars $7,000 and $15,000, depending on the length and the complexity and the publisher. But it demonstrates what happens to the monograph, the more participating libraries, the lower the cost per library. And I'm going to run out of time very quickly, but I'd like you to bear with me. Can I just go through three minutes? I just really want to go through what stays the same, and then I want to say something about the pilot project. What stays the same? Publishers undertake selection, peer review, production, etc. They decide on the formats and pricing, and libraries make selections the way they used to. This is keeping the foot in the old camp in order to bring them into the new world. And these are the publishers that we're working with now. Um, about a dozen of these will have titles for the first round of books, which will be offered for unlatching in the autumn. And we have lots of partners. Um, the slides will be circulated. I won't read them out. Uh, but I do want to pay tribute to Tom Cochran, who is here, who was our first supporter from Australia. Um, and Ralph Schimmer, who's also been very, very helpful in uh, Germany, and um, Lorena Stell, who's here from GIS Collections. Probably forgotten some people, but uh, we're getting tremendous support. Uh, these are the subject areas that we're starting with. Uh, we're going to start with a single collection rather than title by title, because we can go with a single collection to each library and get one check. Next year, we'll start working with subject collections and single titles, um, but it's, um, it's more complicated, and we have to start somewhere, and we're trying to make it as easy and friction-free as possible. So in 2014, we review results, begin metric studies, iron out bugs, and scale up, and that's when we can start working with the non-traditional publishers. Now, how are we going to be sustainable? First three years, we have our grants that will cover our costs, and thereafter we'll be taking a tiny slice of the title fee. So what's different about Knowledge Unlatched? Well, it spreads the cost, costs across many institutions. We are global, and we have gone to the library community for the funding. It, we may go to other communities later on. I would like to talk to Sally about uh, learned societies, because there may be something we can be helpful to her there. Uh, we want to retain a market element. By market, I mean the academics, the libraries. This, um, we, sh we should not just be shoving stuff out there that uh, nobody wants. Uh, we hope to be minimally disrupt disrupted. We hope to, we will be drawing on established funding pools. The whole idea came when I thought to myself, "Who's funding monographs now?" Well, ninety percent of it is coming from library budgets. <coughs> We're distanced from university politics, lots of bloodbath around on that. Uh, we, we hope not to enter into that, um, etc. So there's one slide that I want to finish with. I hope I'll do it in one minute. It's the battlefronts. To mandate or not to mandate? That is the question. Now, personally, I can't see Humanities and social sciences, long-form publications, disadvantage when physical sciences are mo motoring along with a much faster pace of research being uh, disseminated and us staying closed. There has to be a way of dealing with this, and I hope that mandates will be covering monographs soon. Not that necessarily the 
blockbuster trade book, but monographs. And research, uh, I hate the word monographs, so research findings, I agree, they will all be different. They'll have different names. Costs, hidden or not so kid hidden. What will be acceptable costs? We do need the transparency, and I, 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 I applaud those efforts. New versus traditional publishers. It's for the academy and for funders to decide uh, who is providing a respectable service uh, and a service that meets the needs of uh, scholarly communications. Because that's finally, at the end of the day, what we're all about. So I could go on for hours. I have a wonderful <laughs> team here. Uh, there are five of us from Knowledge Unlatched here over the next two days, and I hope you'll all talk to all of us. Thank you. Thank you, Francis. Um, does anyone have a burning question for Francis? Is anyone exploding? With... <laughs> nope. Okay. In that case, um, next up is Carrie Kelder from Palgrave Macmillan. Hello. So I'm going to be talking about monograph publication charges. This is the model that I think is um, probably most familiar to people for one reason, because it more closely resembles what we've seen happen in journals publishing but also because it seems to be the most contentious model as well, and we've already had a few comments about it today. Um, I'm going to take you through um, Palgrave Macmillan's evolution with open access, then look at the publication charge model, um, specifically looking at the publishing process, what's included, how the model works, what the charges cover, and then get on to the hotly debated topic of how much, how do they compare. I've got our pricing along with some other publishers to share with you. I'm gonna talk about why we chose this model, um, who we think should pay, how we see it working, um, and really how sustainable it will be for the future. So very briefly, um, Palgrave Macmillan, for those of you that don't know, is one of the largest um, publishers of monographs in the humanities and social sciences. We publish, um, or will publish, 1,700 titles this year. We also publish um, a mid-form um, format, which we launched last year. And we publish 60 journals, including a number of society titles. So we really do like to think that we, we offer a format a length for um, <laughs> for every researcher within humanities and social sciences. Quality is really at the heart of our publishing service, we like to think, and it's at the heart of the, the output that we produce, and to that end, we won 30 publishing awards last year. Our relationship with open access is fairly short because really, as we've all acknowledged, open access in the humanities and social sciences is really only evolving over the last couple of years, and we are solely focused on this market. We undertook our first open access survey a few years ago, which interestingly for us really revealed that researchers were interested in having an OA outlet. And actually they said to us the only reason that they weren't publishing that route is because there wasn't many formats available for them. We then launched, um, following that, our hybrid offering on a number of journals in 2011. Um, but really, Further to that, started really thinking about bigger than, than just journals, what else could we do with open access? Following um, Finch and the AHRC announcements um, last year, we knew that we really had to make some changes, but rather than just go as far as to comply with the mandates, we thought, actually, let's be consistent across all of our formats and offer CC BY not just in our journals, but actually for Palgrave Pivots, our mid-form offering, and monographs. And all the while, we are really trying to continue um, speaking with our market because, well, as we've already heard today, there, I don't think there's any easy answer for, um, for how open access is going to work in humanities and social sciences. So just to clarify, our position really on open access is that we, we're committed to giving our market a choice, be that in length and format or in business model. Um, but what we really want to do is find a, a model that's sustainable um, both for our market but also for us as publishers. So the publication charge model. What I've crudely put together in this um, 
this cycle is what I see as the monograph publication process. And if I take you through how it works with traditional monograph publishing, um, the researcher undertakes their, their work. They su um, submit an abstract proposal to the publisher, who then <coughs> sends it out for peer review. If it's accepted, the researcher goes away, completes their work, Further checks are done um, when it's handed over to the publisher. They, um, I should say, sorry, after the initial peer review, once it's accepted, that's when they engage in their contract with the publisher. They hand over the, the final work to the publisher. Um, then copy editing, formatting, um, advanced notices for sales are sent out. Marketing starts taking place. Um, it gets distributed through the various sales channels. Um, and then the content is consumed. That's our traditional um, publishing life cycle of a monograph. And under the monograph publication charge model, the process is largely the same. The only real difference um, in what we're offering is where we, where we take the money. And so once a researcher submits their work, if it's been accepted after peer review, at the contract stage, we would then ask them to sign an open access contract with us rather than the traditional contract. It goes through all of the same standards. The publishing service is exactly the same. We're able to send advance notices out. Um, we offer all of the same marketing. One of the questions that was raised this morning is if something's open access, would publishers be obliged to market it? Well, as far as we're concerned, that's very much part of the service that we offer. So everything is exactly the same. The book is made available on our ebook platform, Connect, on Amazon. But the difference is when it's been paid for to be open access, it's freely available on all of those outlets. So what does the charge cover? Um, there is a cost to, to publishing. And you know, we're, we're publishers, we're not just printers, and so the cost is much more than just producing the final print version of the book. Um, and so the, what the cost covers with Palgrave, this £11,000 that has already been mentioned, really is exactly the same as our traditional service. Um, it covers the editorial costs. Our editors work closely um, with our authors, helping improve the manuscript, giving feedback, support. In production, um, it will include copy editing, all the various formats um, that the research gets produced into. It involves customer service. Um, this can be author services, helping with launch materials, launch um, events. Marketing can be anything from sending review copies out, which gets done for every single one of our monographs, and this still takes place under open access. Um, attending conferences and promoting. Um, titles. At Palgrave, we attend over 160 academic conferences a year. These aren't trivial activities. They all really do contribute to the wider um, dissemination of the book. The dissemination through bibliographic services is really key for any title really getting found and read. Um, reaching library suppliers, bookshops, online retailers like Amazon. We supply mark records to libraries. Um, and we include long-term preservation really as part of our responsibilities. So all of this together is how we, we costed this, this up, and this is how we came up with our, our pricing. Um, Karen might, um, and some of the open guys might recognize these um, pictures. We were part of the open project where we were asked with post-it notes to write down all the different elements that were involved in, in publishing a monograph. And I thought they're a nice illustration to show just how many bits there are <laughs> to um, publishing a book that we felt that we were involved with. So the highly anticipated slide, <laughs> um, which actually you can't read. <laughs> I would say that um, this is available on our website, palgrave.com forward slash open. Um, and I'll first apologize because this by no means covers all of the, the publishers that are really experimenting with um, open access right now. But what we tried to do is look at some of the major publishers that were offering open access monographs with a publication charge and pull them all together so we could really compare and see what was included in the different prices. Because it, it's, it's not easy to compare. And the simple reason is because nobody is offering exactly the same thing. Um, there's been a 
few comments on the offerings of different publishers. I would say that right now, Palgrave's the only publisher that I'm aware of that is actually offering CC BY. Springer um, Open offer CC BY on their journals, but CC BY and C on their um, monographs. Um, we're also the only publisher right now offering free EPUB version of the books, which means um, it's freely available on Amazon for one, but also means it's compatible with all mobile devices, meaning it's more accessible to actually people maybe in developing countries that don't have a strong access to the internet. Um, but our prices aren't at the, the cheapest end of the, the scale there either. There really is a range of what people are offering with licensing, what formats they're offering. And what I think is just really important is for publishers to just be really transparent with what they're offering. And that's why I wanted to explain our service. We, by offering CC buyers, was um, acknowledged by Francis. We priced our monographs on the basis that actually we don't stand to make any other additional revenues. Um, and so we really, when coming up with our price, it was looking at the full cost and no more. But it makes it hard if actually some of the other publishers, if that's not what they're doing and they're standing to make other revenues, then it is very hard to compare and say what's the true cost of publishing. I thought you were waving at me. <laughs> um, why we chose this model? We felt it was sustainable and future-proof, and I say that from a publisher's point of view. Um, we wanted to come up with a model that wasn't necessarily reliant on print revenues. Um, if we're looking to the future and talking about how formats might and technology might evolve, then we have to say that further down the line than print revenues um, could also decline. And so we wanted to have a model which really wasn't relying on having print to, to prop up um, the business. Uh, we wanted a model which was transparent, so I thought it was funny <laughs> um, that I'm a bit in conflict with uh, Martin on this, but I felt that by us saying, hands up, this is what our cost for publishing is, and this is what our publishing service is, then actually people can make a decision um, with which publisher they want to go with. Yes, we, which I'll talk about in a minute, haven't really published many or any monographs this route right now, but actually by offering exactly the same service as we do with all of our other um, monograph publishing, you can make a comparison of what the service is. So we felt it, it was transparent. Um, I also felt that um, this business model associates the true cost of publishing in the rightful place. So whilst there is a cost to producing, um, even doing handling of print-on-demand titles, and there is a cost for producing EPUB versions and enhanced version of, of books, they're not the only costs in publishing. And if you, if you start charging people just for those extra bits, I think it can send out a confusing message. And for us, having um, a simple price to our market to say, this is what our costs are in their entirety, um, seemed the right way to go. We wanted to be consistent um, and as simple as possible. Open access is confusing enough if it's not something that you talk about day in and day out. And being a publisher of cross different formats, we felt that it was right that actually we have the same consistent pricing model that we can explain for our journals, for our mid-form Palgrave pivot and for monographs. But who pays? That is the, one of the big questions here. I, I, it's still very much to be determined. For us, this has always been about offering choice. I don't think it's necessarily going to, to have the same impact that we've seen so quickly in STM. I'm, I'm, uh, the funds just um, simply aren't there. Um, some, some monies are there. Um, certainly, we've had a lot of queries um, from researchers. Um, so I'm looking to see if they can find it in their grant funds, but the funds just aren't as much. Um, some funders, as Francis mentioned, um, are looking to cover open access publishing. And the Wellcome Trust, certainly, that's, for me, has guaranteed that we probably will have more open access monographs next year than, than we previously forecast, because they will be mandating um, open access and providing funds for gold. And some institutions we think may help cover the cost. Certainly a number of institutions have got um, central open access funds, which include monographs as well as journals. It's just that they currently have a journals cap on them. So it may not be all of the monies that's actually needed. 
So lastly, um, take up and the future. The interest is definitely there. This is why that we wanted to um, move into open access and we were having lots of queries. But the take up is slow. As I said, we have published to date um, zero open access monographs. But then we only did announce this at the end of January and actually producing the monographs, it's a, a long process. If I was forced to guess, and because somebody will probably ask me anyway, I will say that I would think that we'll publish um, one open access monograph by the end of the year and I would predict about 10 next year. But funding is a challenge, that's what we're seeing is we've had a lot of engagement with researchers and then them having to go and speak to their funders or um, institutions who might be keen, but actually there's no process in place. It's just logistically quite hard to, to push things through. Um, and I think really conferences like this are the best thing that we can do. I think we all have to engage, experiment, talk to each other, um, not be competitive with the different models we've got and actually just see what we can, see what we can do. Thank you. Right, thank you very much, Kerry. Um, so um, we have about uh, 10 minutes now for questions. And since everybody's been holding them in all, all the way through, I'm sure we have plenty. Um, so do we have any questions for the panel? So do you want me to start again? We'll, we'll catch that. Oh, it's okay. Thank you. Good. Um, yeah, we can all talk about, as authors, whether the editorial support from the publisher is actually where the value comes. I mean, I would argue it comes from other academics who are co-opted to be ed series editors and that sort of thing. And similarly, with marketing, the um, question would surely be, how good is it when we're only selling, say, 500 copies of each um, book? But what I wanted to ask you as a question was that last one you listed, Preservation, long-term preservation as a cost borne by publishers. Could you give me some details of what work is done by Paul Grave McMillan in that area? Thanks. Um, so all of the, um, the monographs that we publish are made um, available on Palgrave Connect, our ebook platform, and that's archived in Portugo, so that would be the same for the open access monographs. And we do think that it's part of our job as publishers, certainly if... Um, if touch wood, <laughs> you know, for some reason that Palgrave wasn't around in the future, that it's our job to make sure that the, the outputs that we publish are made long term available. Yeah, Sorry, so our um, ebook platform is supported, is it Portico Hazel? Yeah. Preservation is something I think of libraries doing. We're talking here about keeping things going for decades, hundreds of years. Are you suggesting there's something the publisher is doing that is yes, helping Yes, this is, the sorry, Portico, where all of, our, all of our content is archived in that. So you've created that archive. That's, that's, yep. what, that's what you meant by the long-term application uh, preservation. Um, I think the, um, if I could explain, there are a number of companies that provide long-term preservation, and I mean thinking down the line when various digital formats have, are changing time and time again. Portico is one of them, Clocks Locks is one of them, and um, most of the um, publishers that you would know of are preserving their content in one or the other or even both. Um, th they're taking preservation very seriously. But, but the preservation is not access. Preservation is something else. And of course, in the, in the States, there's the Hattie Trust, so, uh, and there's the Internet Archive. So there, there are lots of ways in which um, preservation is being um, addressed, uh, particularly the question of not just <laughs> should a publisher disappear, but should the form, digital format mm -hmm. that is being used today not be accessible tomorrow. So everything has to migrate, and that's what these companies, publishers pay these companies to provide that service, that they ensure they'll keep on migrating to the right new digital format, when PDF has died and you know, all that. Uh, we have one more question at the front from Jean-Claude. Oh, he's going to kill us. 
Thank you. Yes, I'm a little bit puzzled by all this. I'm a little bit puzzled by all this because uh, if libraries don't take care of the preservation anymore and uh, the metadata <coughs> admittedly will come from the publishers as well, uh, and it seems to me that in the end the libraries are going to be the financing support for publishers. They're going to pay the licenses and then just have to retire. Um, uh, is, that, is that the future you see for libraries? I think of, um, I mean, if, you, if you read the surveys on the future of the library that they, they, come, they come up with for their own basis, they seem to be gesturing towards the library as a bi-directional information hub. So they are to do with gluing things together from the publishing world. You have disparate publishers, and they're about making sure that researchers aren't lost in the, the digital world when all, there are different platforms. That's a hideous sort of analogy there. But they're about finding things. They're about also, I think, the publication process itself, and that there should be dialogue between publishers and libraries and researchers in a three-way triangle where they're they're helping guide us in ways that we don't cripple their budgets through our publication choices in some ways. Um, for, for, for 40 years, we have been utterly complicit as academics in creating that serious crisis through setting up this hideous cycle of prestige. Um, if we'd spoken to libraries and knew the position that we were putting them in earlier on, perhaps that wouldn't have occurred. And I think they're a vital part of a triangular relationship there. That's my perception anyway. Uh, actually, uh, this is somebody from the British Library summarized it very well, saying that that libraries are moving from collecting to connecting, and that seems to me to be uh, acknowledging that for each library to have duplicate collections of the library down the road is just twentieth century and no longer relevant or appropriate, and to create a, a web where everybody can find everything all of the time is the end game, isn't it? That's the end goal. And we have to find ways of getting there, but uh, with the amount of content increasing at the rate that it's increasing at the moment, all those pressures and being in uh, times of, of difficult funding, um, it's just taking a while to figure out how to get there. But it, it does have to be a partnership. I, I don't think library, press, publishing is the only solution. I think it's part of a solution, but it will require people having different skills, and that will mean different people. Um, and, and, and we're inching, all of us seem to be inching our way forward in this. Of course, with monographs, there's far less money in the system, uh, and there's far less profit in the system. Um, I, was, I was saying to Jean-Claude over lunch that there, there aren't publishers making 35% profit margin on monographs, and he said, well, what about Springer? But the point is that Springer doesn't publish very many monographs, and the monograph scene isn't dominated by six large journal publishers, uh, the monograph scene is one with a lot of small companies, with a very small number of large companies, but even you know, your, <laughs> the book division of Palgrave is, is still small compared to the big journal divisions of the top six who have a stranglehold on journal publishing. So you know, we're looking at a very different environment here, and uh, monograph publishing is either making a tiny profit or no profit or, or even a loss in, in many cases, particularly the American university presses. Okay, um, we have time for one final short question. Down the middle. Hi, I'm Julie Walker from INASP. Um, I saw your sentence about, um, it said applications from developing countries. And unfortunately, you didn't have time to go over that bit. And I just wondered if you could explain how you're going to encourage the participation of developing countries. Well, I wonder whether I could ask Martin Hall to say something about the idea that um, we're going to be working on together. Martin, where are you? Is he here? Is he left? Oh, there you are. 
Would you be willing to say a word? Just, it's slightly premature, but it's much better coming from Martin. KU okay, South. And then we'll wrap up. Thanks, Francis. I, I thought I was completely safe <laughs> at, at the back here. <laughs> um, yes, thank you. We, we, we'd been discussing this because we thought that there were some interesting opportunities in the knowledge unlatch model for connecting uh, authors in the south with publishers in the north. And the, our observation is that, that, that if you go outside the west and the north and you go into areas where uh, people have not had access to any form of publishing resources. There are huge um, um, resources of, of knowledge that is as valuable to the North and West as it is in the South, but it's just not getting out there and hasn't got out there conventionally. And of course, anybody who works in special collections in libraries will know this is a massive so-called gray literature that's been sitting there for years. Um, we think that the digital publishing opportunities give an opportunity for the two-way benefit of that. And to get away from the sort of implicit, almost neo-colonial model that says that we're about publishing in the north and distributing more cheaply in the south without actually having a flow back of knowledge creation in the south to the benefit of the north. And by uh, uh, developing the sorts of models that people have been talking out today to make those connections, we think it's possible to get the knowledge content flowing both ways, which of course is inherently uh, more interesting to all of us than only having the knowledge flow one way, and that's what Francis is talking about. I, I'm sure that if we can get the sorts of models that are being talked about today to be viable, one of the huge benefits of the digital publishing opportunities we have will be to allow that, which is a far more democratic distribution of knowledge across the world. Okay. I couldn't have said it better myself. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. Um, we're, we're now going to move on to, to coffee for 20 minutes. Uh, we're back at um, 3.30. Uh, before that, I'd like to thank the panel um, for their contributions. Thank you.